Hi guys, I'm here again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Rosie, can you hear me? Can hear you. You can hear you, and you can see me. Okay, great. We're there. Okay, I'm going to try and change as little as possible. Okay, and I'm going to go. I'm just going to put everything on this screen here, and I'm just going to go. Whoops, there's Arthur again. Right. Just tell me. Just tell me whether you can see that screen. I'm going to go. Can you hear me there, Rosie? Right. This is the. So this is the. Okay. I think we've got the. We've got the thumbs up. Okay. Good. So nobody breathe, please. Okay. So just saying, big link between brain and gut, and uh, the science there are science labs which are going absolutely mad at the moment with the uh with the research that they're doing and um it's this is a just to show you how up to the minute this stuff is this is this is a paper from the pasteur institute um and it's only two or three months old um, and uh, just I've just highlighted it. You can, you can take your time. You can look at this stuff uh, afterwards. If you just go to the Vermex Facebook page, you'll find everything there. And um, I've just highlighted these findings show that healthy gut microbiota contributes to normal brain function. OK, they've done lots of um, studies at the Pasteur Institute. And there's a there's a strong correlation there. This is a paper from uh from nature nature now nature is about as big as it gets it's about the most respected science magazine the science publication in the world and they've recently on the 3rd of february they've done a a, a news feature um all about all about uh, the microbiome and the, and the brain. This is a really, really good, a good article. Okay. And so I would strongly suggest, and what I really liked, I know, it's a good, it's a good, it's a very good article. It takes you through a lot of the really up to date stuff. But what I really liked was the, the picture here. You see, you've got all these bugs in the middle uh, who are playing kind of computer game consoles and they are linked by wires, i.e. they're not linked directly to the screen where you've got a brain with a cap on. And so it's just quite a nice graphic of showing that your bugs really do have a direct, they really do have a direct um, effect on the, uh, on the brain. Um, I'm really interested in worms and immunity and the gut, and therefore, because these things are all tied up, worms and immunity and the brain, okay? Fascinating uh, linkage. And we can link these things together through psychoneuroendocrino immunology, which is a posh way of saying your, your what you think influences your nervous system, what your nervous system can influence your endocrine, your hormone system, and those can influence your Im immune system. But, any one of those four elements can influence the other three. Yeah. So it looks like it's a line. What you think influences your immune system, but actually it's a network and all those, those, those four elements will work together. And if you've got uh, an overwhelming burden of worms in your gut, that is going to have significant influence on your, uh, on your mind, on your nervous system, on your hormone system, on your immune system if you really don't like worms i apologize for having that picture on the screen for half a minute some people don't like worms i don't know why i think they're fantastic so here's some thoughts on on how worms 
can influence your microbiome and obviously your microbiome can influence your mind and your your animal's behavior so it pays to have good gut hygiene um, so the effects there's three major effects that they talk about here number one is when you've got bugs in you when you've got worms in your gut you will you will change the your your gut will recognize them and will 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 start with immune uh, uh, immune effects that will affect the the worms which is what it's designed to but it will also possibly uh skew your microbiome there are other uh factors in that the gut itself will also produce antimicrobial proteins which will potentially skew your microbiome and also the worms that are in your gut they will be producing mucus and they will have squames coming off their integument which is the posh name for the skin and they will be going into the microbiome and potentially upsetting it and potentially skewing it again so it really does pay to keep up to keep up with with uh, intestinal hygiene apart from you know keeping the, the animal happy and no and and, and pr pr protecting children especially from zoonotic effects of 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 worms so it really pays to to be to do plenty of work in that direction um, from the same paper it talks about what can we do to help uh to influence to negate uh worms within our gut and it suggests there's there's three elements there i'd say there's four actually but i will add that one at the end so we've got probiotics by taking good probiotics you can uh you can influence your uh t2 helper cells which can then change the way your immune cells, for example, on the photo here, there's a there's a basophil degranulating and knocking out um, knocking out the uh, the worms. Taking prebiotics can can uh, upregulate lactobacilli, for example, which can drop the pH, which then can negatively influence the worms. All good stuff. And also, um, if one is careful in the choice of food. One can turn a, 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 a an unfavorable microbiome. You can twist it more in the right way. And obviously, what these guys, this, this these very clever people, Laura Peachy et al., they've got about herbs. Herbs can affect your gut. Herbs can affect your immune system. Herbs can affect your the motility of the gut. Herbs can affect negatively the worms in if there are worms in the gut. And so. Uh, never forget the power of, wor uh, of of herbs when we're thinking about uh, worms in the gut. Very, very important stuff. Lovely, lovely slide, which basically <laughs> is a posh way of saying your brain and your gut talk together massively. Your brain and your gut talk together massively. And it's saying that if you've got if your gut is healthy, for example, this is chicken and egg, classic. If your brain's not healthy, your gut won't be. And if your gut's not healthy, your brain won't be. And so and so and so. But on the good side, you can influence your gut. Can't influence your brain quite that much directly, but you can influence your gut because you can change your microbiome. Therefore, that th this you, you can break that chicken and egg scenario. So if you've got um, a, a healthy gut, then you're going to have. Uh, healthy neuroendocrine, which is the nerves and the the hormones, you're going to have um, healthy levels of immune cells in the blood and in the in the tissues, and that's going to help uh, towards creating good um, uh, a good microbiome. If this becomes altered, you get a depression of neuroendocrine communication, neuroimmune. This is the psycho neuroendocrino immunology side of things. You get more inflammatory markers, you get distortion of the biome, and you get gut permeability, which we've nowadays, we've called it leaky gut. So everybody's got leaky gut these days, eh? But let's let's have a look at that a little bit more, more closely. Um, um, I've got a very good slide 
in a second and i'm going to talk about leaky gut just after after we talk about how does the brain and the gut communicate okay there are there are four there are many more but these are the these are the simple ones these are the ones that have really been much more much much better researched one two three four and so let's have a look at the first uh, uh communication this is where dendritic cells they're basically they sit outside the gut and they've got this whacking great long tongue and they taste what's happening within the gut they taste what the what the bugs are producing and if happy bugs produce a happy soup of of microbiome uh and therefore the dendritic cells taste that and go aha all is well with the world and they produce these cytokines which enter the bloodstream and go to the brain and the bread brain says the uh the dendritic cells are happy everybody's happy and what have you and this happens on, on, a, on a continual basis it's like a computer yeah everything talks to everything all the time perfect amazing the uh the next is where we have cells which actually live in the gut wall, wall. uh they're called enteroendocrine cells which means they <laughs> they are gut cells which have hormonal effects entero is gut and endocrine uh means uh hormone okay so these these are specialized cells within your gut which also tastes what's happening in the microbiome and re and and release neurotransmitters behind them yeah in front of them is the gut and the microbiome behind them uh sitting in 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 the gut wall they release these neurotransmitters and communicate directly mainly via the vagus nerve now when i was at, at college the vagus nerve was just you know, it was interesting because we thought it's the way that the brain communicates with the gut nowadays we we now and this is complete revelation we now know there's there's almost 10 times as much information going up your nerve your vagus nerve than there is coming down the vagus nerve and it again a massive area of of research for example the if this this is a paper and roughly translated it means you can chase it it's a recent it's a, 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 a 2011 paper but it, it's all there okay the references now i'm not going to bore you with the detail you can you can chase that if you'd like but basically they're saying that if you feed these mice you can uh, the lactobacillus uh, uh, probiotic you can change their behavior and you can eliminate that change in behavior if you cut the vagus nerve not a very nice thing to do to a mouse and i don't agree with vivisection uh but they've done the, that that study and so i'm going to move rapidly on it's a sticky sticky subject and and it's, it's it's not a very pleasant subject but this is how we learn about these things unfortunately um so giving the mouse lactobacillus changes behavior that that change in behavior can be eliminated by cutting one nerve between the gut and the brain therefore it the gut is affecting the brain via the vagus nerve amazing 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 here's another one this is this is a 2018 and roughly translated that that means that the vagus nerve uh the gut influences the vagus and the vagus uh influences the expression of this stuff called bdnf which is brain derived neurotropic factor which basically helps with the regeneration of brain tissue okay so if we go to the highlighted area there at the bottom taken together these findings suggest the vagal nerve act have vagal nerve activity influences neurogenesis the growing of nerves and the bdnf mrna expression in the adult hippocampus hippocampus is a little horse it's it's um it's shaped a little bit like a a uh um what are those fish the the, the seahorse uh, it looks a bit like one of those and that's why it's called the hippocampus so your gut 
influences little seahorse in here called the hippocampus. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, so that was number two. Uh, the vagus nerve. How important the vagus nerve is. Number three on our on our picture here is that the the gut wall itself, even though it's not a, even uh, even cells that are not uh, enteroendocrine cells, there will be especially if it's leaky, there will be metabolites which, which enter the bloodstream and they are tasted by the brain and the brain will react accordingly. You know, things like glucose and uh, ketones and um, um, fatty acids and, and, and things like that. Uh, because if, you, if, if after a meal you're having an increase in these, then the brain has to activate the liver for example okay so it's all part of controlling and sensing and controlling what's happening within the body okay um so th so that's the metabolites from the from the gut and um I, this is the diagram that i wanted to show you about leaky gut what is leaky gut the answer is so on the left we've got a healthy gut and as as you think they've got these wonderful things called tight junctions i always think of them interdigitating like this okay so you've got one cell here and you've got one cell here and they they have a really nice tight junction. so it's like like a a well sealed shower unit yeah no water leaks out but what happens with the leaky gut is that the the very thin the, the lining of your gut is one cell thick and it's very easily disrupted by stress and toxins and wrong food and wrong um, drink, you know, too much coffee and and, th and too much too much Coca Cola and things like that. Actually, um, and when it's when it's when it's injured, it, these these tight junctions come apart and you get gaps. Hence, leaky gut. Okay, leaky gut syndrome. And what can happen is is two things. One is that those bacteria can drop down into your bloodstream. The blood, there's lots of blood in your in the in the gut wall. Uh, so um, the uh, bacteria can enter your bloodstream, and also your uh, antibodies and things can leak into the gut itself and start causing uh inappropriate immune reactions within your gut because you've got all these uh immunoactive um molecules entering your bloodstream okay so it's a bit of a nightmare scenario and to be avoided at all costs which is why we look after our uh, our gut hygiene and we look after our stress and we look after our food as well as possible i've got some great references at the end and i have got some practical steps at the end fear not and the fourth mechanism the fourth you know fourth area how bacteria influence the brain is that they sit in your brain yeah your dog your cat your horse you your kids everybody has got we think bacteria specialized and non harmful bacteria in our brains this is a this is a, a an image from the brain uh and so on the right hand side that big lake like thing that is a blood vessel okay so you've got a blood vessel wall and then just outside that you've got a, 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 a like a constellation of one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven kind of slightly darker blobs than the surrounding tissue they're bacteria Okay, and this was from a healthy brain. So this, you know, pff, revelation. This is this is mass revelation. When I was at college, the brain was sterile. When I was at college, the placenta was sterile. When I was at college, the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor inside your eyes was sterile. But nowadays, we know they're not. All these areas. Are, in fact, there isn't really a tissue in your body, or your dog, or your horse, or your whatever you've got that doesn't have some resident helpful bacteria.
how's that for a revelation i told you this evening was going to be full of revelations it really is it's 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 brilliant so um where are we so let's be practical let's keep it practical so what can we do to help our gut because by helping our gut we can help our brain what can we do to help our dogs and our horses and our cats we in order to help the gut to help the brain and so the first one as i say good gut hygiene yeah get those worms out uh send poo samples off to uh the laboratory uh whether you use, use uh, wormcount.com or westgate or the other one is fec lab f-e-c-l-a-b you have to be careful how you say that fec lab f-e-c lab um who go go with whoever you like um make sure you, you're worm free and if uh, I, I, I keep on top of that i think that's really important as far as dogs and cats are concerned i'm a big fan of raw food um and so i would obviously say go raw if that's too much for you i would suggest look into going to fresh there are some companies for example people like different dog or button up box who will they cook the food very lightly and freeze it and send it to you so for me anything to get 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 your your dogs and cats off uh ultra processed food is so so important okay i would i beg you to consider moving away from the kibbles and the tins of this world you'll thank me for it i promise you um another really simple thing that that we can do for our cats and our dogs and for our our, our horses is uh to give an omega-3 oil source for cats and dogs that would be uh either fish or flax oil for dogs flax oil for cats i'd stick with more the marine oils and you can either use krill oil or you can use sardine oil or you can use um salmon or pollock oils things like that they're they're, they're chock-a-block with omega-3s they've done studies in, in children for example from a behavioral perspective They've done studies in children, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll take the school and they'll divide it in two. They'll give half the school um, omega-3 supplements, fish oil supplements, for a month or two, and they will look at the attainment scores of the, the, the children taking the fish oil and the children taking the non-fish oil and compare them. And they have done these studies, and they have shown that there is, there is an improvement. They con the children concentrate better, better behavior, um, karma all of those things and certainly people i talk to it, it they'll say that animals much karma when they have been on a an omega-3 source so it's the it's the easiest food change whatever you're feeding your dog or your cat that is the easiest food change in the world these things are very easy to get hold of please don't use farmed fish if you can help it um because farmed Fish farming is not the great for the environment. Um, some references. Always like to give some references to keep you keep you on your toes. Uh, this is a book. Uh, I read it about four years ago. It's called The Diet Myth. Basically, this guy, Tim Spector, had a little bit of a health scare, and he thought he – and he's, he's a super clever doctor – uh, geneticist he thought he was doing it all all properly but he had a bit of a health scare and so he looked at well what is the best diet and he so he looked at all the diets and this is his his four year five year journey through lots of diets where he uncovers what is fact what is fiction if you like tim Spector, and he's he he uh he writes really really well this is his new book it's called spoon fed uh, it's fallen off the side of the slide there. I didn't notice that. The book is called Spoon Fed. I've just started listening to it on Audible, and I'm absolutely blown away. I'm I've only just finished the introduction, and I'm absolutely blown away by it. So Tim Spector, Spoon Fed, it's all about human food. But the thing is, if you if it's a lot easier to understand human food before you go diving into the murky depths of feeding our animals. Um, so. I think get your head around human food and that will allow you to understand the 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 the, the uh, uh, animal food 
side of things. And finally, I told you I'd give you a, a, a quote from John, John Cryan from the Psychobiotic Revolution. He says, he's Irish, I won't do my best Irish accent. If microbes are controlling the brain, then microbes are controlling everything. There you have it, okay? <laughs> you can't control your brain, you can control your gut. So get cracking. And the other slightly less readable, slightly more academic is by uh, Mayer, uh, The Mind-Gut Connection. If you want to just read a little more broadly on the subject, all of these guys are on YouTube. If you're not a big reader, totally fine. Uh, YouTube is a great source of information. There are some, uh, Cryan does a, a, a TED talk and there are several other TED talks talking about the um, the gut brain connection. So there you go, that's us. Let me come back in here. Uh, see if I go like that and then I will, there we go, look at that. I am a master of technology, obviously. So just by the way, if people need to nip off because we're running a bit late, uh, we, next uh, next time uh, we on Thursday, April the 15th, he says, reading his crib sheet, uh, we're doing cats, food and worms. Cats, food and worms, because cats get a bit of a raw, raw deal uh, on the on the on the food side of things. So we're going to the whole program is going to be about cats. And food and worms. What we can do, uh, what 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 techniques, what what uh, supplements and things. So, cats, cats, cats. Next time, um, questions. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, let, I'm going to go. Gosh, lots of long, long, long questions. I'm going to go back up. Ooh, we, you have been busy. Here we go. You can hear me. You can hear me. Great. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me, by the way, guys. I appreciate it. Um, let's have a look. Some questions. Okay. Uh, Karen Reed says, I'm currently studying the gut-brain connection with the center of excellence. Don't know what the center of excellence is, but it sounds like a teaching thing. So just a little, a little plug for the center of excellence. Um, uh, Shelley Zervos says, uh, which herbs do I recommend? Uh, I think she's talking to me. She may not be. Um, for, for, for gut health, well, um, Vermix contains guts and it has a very, uh, very good effect because I know because I've used it in hundreds of animals. Uh, it, it's, um, it's a gut tonic. OK, as well as everything else, it, it, it helps helps with the microbiome, uh, uh, helps with motility, helps with uh, blood, uh, blood supply, blood flow, uh, immunity, everything like that. So you could do worse uh, than looking at uh, talking to the guys at Vermex. The other uh, herbs, if you just want to keep it simple, um, you don't say what species. Let's say we're talking about dogs. So with dogs, there are very few herbs you can't use. So basically, go out into the garden. If you've got some herbs in the garden, you can use it. So parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, go for it. The only place you don't want to use lots of rosemary is with an epileptic dog because it's quite stimulating. Okay, so I hope that begins to answer your, your questions there. Uh, Barbara Andrews said, didn't catch the authors of the title of the book that was recommended. Um, I've repeated the recommendation at the end, Barbara, but if you go to the Verm X Facebook page, you can watch this, uh, this program again. You can just pick up those if you like. Yeah, it's all recorded there. So no problems. Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Questions on pups. Alicia Bradby, Bratby says, question on pups. We re-home re, re at eight weeks about uh, when we know they are potentially in their fear period. Yes, we do. Uh, that's not really a question, but let's pretend it is a question. We do. I think in an ideal, and we got we got our both of our pups at eight weeks and they've been 
pretty good. And most people do, to be honest. Um, uh, is it their fear period? I think that it's also their, 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 the beginning of that plasticity, men, mental plasticity period when they're very good at learning things. So if they're not too traumatized, and obviously we all do as much as we can to minimize trauma for poor puppy when they come to come home, um, then it's a very rich period for learning the new home, learning the new ways of doing things, where the park is, and all these things. So I think there's probably more upsides than downsides um, to to reintroducing or well, introducing pups to the new home at eight weeks okay uh you know because if you leave them on mum till say 12 weeks then they're going to get very habituated to the to the to, to the to the um to the breeder's house and so that, that that transition may be a little more difficult perhaps um uh trisha butler that's very nice of you to say thank you uh and bex thank you uh let's have a look Doo -doo -doo. Uh, you're chatting amongst each other aren't you there you go um uh good 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 uh chatty very pang very chatty tonight emma hardy says uh let me show you this Emma says, can dogs prone to pancreatitis have fish oils? Yes. Um, if they, you know, two weeks ago had pancreatitis, no, I wouldn't give, I wouldn't give them any extra fat. But after three or four weeks, I think that the, the benefit from the very small volumes that you use, because they're so rich, you only need to use tiny amounts, you know, five mils of the average salmon oil will do 10 to 20 kilo dog. Uh, that's not very much. That's a teaspoon. Um, so I would say yes to that because uh, the omega threes are powerfully, very powerfully antioxidant, and and I think that therefore, because pancreatitis is an inflammatory uh, process, then then I think that the omega threes, uh, the benefit will outweigh any any risk. And what I say to people with pancre dogs with pancreatitis, which is where you've got inflamed pancreas, is that the longer you can go with a quiet pancreas the more you can treat it like a, a, a normal pancreas um let's have a look let's have a look what else have we got um uh tanya is saying tanya bisp says i'm feeding linseed to my pony who has a cough and breathing problems at the mo on steroids too okay yeah so there's a kind of copd type issue going on there looking for a good equine probiotic for her and saw coconut yogurt with live bacteria hmm, interesting yeah why not i'm happy with that um, um if you want to go further with that tanya email me and we can we can we can have a chat about uh, uh good probiotics uh okay let's have a look what else have we done Uh, lots. Yes, most of this is you guys talking amongst yourselves. <laughs> okay, let's have a look. Hello. No, you know what? Celia Bourne says, my GP says there's no such thing as leaky gut. Get them to read the uh, Tim Spector book, I would suggest. Uh, call it what you like you know, a, uh, a disrupted endothelial lining of the gut does exist, for sure. Um, uh, Val Brown, would you use goat's milk kefir for dogs every day? Uh, yeah, if your dog's tolerant to it, a wee bit every day uh, would do no harm. I'm tending to move toward, with my supplements, guys, I'm tending to move towards supplementing strategically not every single day so i'll do kind of two weeks on two weeks off or i'll do one week uh, per month uh, something like that rather than all the time all the supplements all the time i think it, it probably mimics uh 
the natural way of things a little bit more closely. Um, uh, let's have a look. Uh, one more question, guys. I think we'll do. Uh, I'm running over because we started late, and I do apologize for that. Um, my dogs have yogurt on their breakfast every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end. But Tito says, please could you refrain from saying C-A-T-S so much because my doggo barks every time. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Good, good, good. Right, guys, it's been a hoot. And thank you very much indeed. Thank you for bearing with me at the moment with my uh, the, 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 the initial problems, the internet what would you do eh? what would you do with it what would we do without it um really really good as i say we're doing uh the the the, the small feline animals food and worms on thursday the 15th of april uh, at eight o'clock um same time same place we really look forward to seeing you from the vermex page i really want to thank the vermex guys for making it possible for me to talk to you about all things gut health. Really, really good. Couldn't be better. Take care, be well, and I look forward to speaking to you in four short weeks. Take care. See you soon. Thank you.